Welcome back to this series on architectural simplification. Today we'll be looking at horizontal scaling or how CockroachDB makes horizontal sharding of data to achieve scale so much simpler. I frequently referred to sharding in Postgres being hard, but I've only been saying that from anecdotal evidence of other people performing sharding. I've given it a go myself, and in today's demo, you'll see that I'm using the foreign data wrapper, which is a level above doing manual sharding. This one broke me, and I'll take you on the journey. I figured everything out by this point, but it's taken a long time of figuring things out, a lot of Googling, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of fumbling around in the dark. So sit back, enjoy this one's going to be a long one the before scenario will look like this i'm going to start with a single node this is day one of my business it's a uk based business after a year i would have achieved some level of success and i need to scale and for that i'll be using hash sharding in postgres next year two again a continuation of my business's success which will necessitate resharding of the data to shard across three nodes three years later my business is now enjoying global success and I'll need to reshard and geo partition my database in order to keep data where it needs to be. The after scenario will start with a three node CockroachDB cluster, which is the smallest recommended cluster size. And five years later, when my business hits global success, I'll create a new column to partition by, and that will allow me to use the regional by row table topology. Just to show uptimes, query latencies, and things like that, I've got an extremely simple Go application, which connects to the database. And after every second, we'll just select the number of customers that I have in the database and print it out to the console. So let's get going. I'll create my first node in Postgres. What I'll do, I'll create a database called EUDB1, but that's just to help me name things. I don't know it's going to be the first of many, so just ignore the name of this. I then wrote a little application to wait for it to become available before connecting to it. So I'll spin that up and connect. Now I'll create a customer table with an ID and an email. There's no mention of regions yet because I'm only running in one region. I don't know that my application is going to need to be multi-region at some point. I'll insert a thousand random customers into the database with a random ID and a random email. I'll now start my client just so we can see query latencies and things like that. Let's assume we're now a year ahead. I'll add a new node into my cluster, this time called EUDB2 and listening on a different port and I'll wait for it to become available. Now I'll need to start using the Postgres foreign data wrapper. I'll enable that on both the original and the new server. And in order for me to distribute data across servers, the table will need to exist on all servers. So I'll create the customer table, same as before, but this time against the new server. I'll create a server construct on the first server that references the new server, and I'll use the foreign data wrapper for that. Because I'm using Docker containers, rather than using local host, I'm using host Docker internal. Because it's all running on local host, I don't have to do anything with the pghba.conf file. If these were running across different hardware, I would need to do that as a separate step, but I can skip that. Next, I'll map the Postgres user on server two to the Postgres user on server one and grant it permissions. If I didn't do this, I wouldn't be able to access any of the tables. Now it's time to partition the data. First, I'll create a table called customer partitioned. It's going to be like customer, so it's going to take all of the columns of customer, and I'm going to partition by hash of ID. That will allow me to scale onto multiple nodes. I have to create this intermediate table because the original customer table isn't partitioned. Now I'll create two partitions of that. There'll be a customer zero and a customer one. Customer zero will exist on this server, and I'll use modulus two remainder zero. So I'll be performing a modulo operator on the ID. Next, I'll create a foreign table on the EUDB2 server for everything modulus 2, remainder 1, so everything else. In order for partitioning to work, you have to factor in all of the row space. So by doing a modulus 2, remainder 0, and remainder 1, I take into consideration both odd and even numbers, and they can go to their respective servers. Now I'll insert data into the partition table from the original table. It would probably make sense to have a downtime window here because if I'm inserting everything at this point, any new data into the customer table won't get picked up in the customer partition table. So there would need to be a downtime window here, but I'm not gonna do that. Next, I'll create a transaction in which I'll drop the customer table and replace the customer partition table with that table. So essentially, the customer partition table will replace our customer table. Notice down here that because Postgres doesn't support online schema changes, there'll be a delay in this. And the larger the table, the larger the delay. So that's finished. And now notice that my latencies have gone up. That's because Postgres is now having to select across two servers. They're both local to my machine, but it still entails latency. Next, just to test that, I'll insert a thousand new customers. This will go up to 2000. And now I'll perform some checks just to make sure that the partitioning has been successful. I'll select everything from customer, everything from customer zero, and everything from customer one, the two shards. And I'm seeing exactly what I'd expect, 2000 in total. 
from the original 1000 and the new 1000 I just inserted and a distribution of those 2000 across those two shards. And interestingly, if I do a select across the relation size, we'll see that the customer table actually doesn't contain any rows because it's sharded across customer zero and customer one. Customer zero appears to have data in it because that is local to us, but customer one doesn't have data in it because that physical data is located on another server. Now let's shard again. This is year two sharding. So we are now here. We've done our hash sharding. Now we're gonna reshard to be across three nodes. I'll spin up my third Postgres server and wait for it to become available. I'll enable the foreign data wrapper on this server. I'll create the customer table on the third server. I'll make the original server aware of the new server. So EUDB3 will point to localhost port 5434 and I'll map the Postgres users. It's not recommended to map the Postgres users, but because I'm running everything locally, I've decided to do it that way. And now because the second server already has a customer table on it, I have to create a new customer table called customer new on the second server. I can't work against the existing customer table because I'm about to repartition it. Now I can create a new partition table as I did before. And now I'll create new hash shards from there. Notice that I'm using underscore new here because I already have a customer zero and a customer one whose modulo was modulo two. This time I'm using modulo three and I'll create three shards. One for the local, one for the second server against the customer new table and another for the customer table on the third server, remainder two this time. So we've got remainder zero, remainder one and remainder two, a complete set. Now I'll insert into the partition table everything from customer. Again, in order to make this consistent, you would need downtime. And again, I need to rename all of the tables here just to get consistency with the previous state. I'll start a transaction in which I'll drop the customer table. I'll replace the customer table with the customer partition table. And then I'll rename the shards just for consistency with my naming conventions for the previous shard example. Again, I'll expect a pause here. And notice again that because I'm now running across three servers, my average latency has risen again. I'll test the table by inserting a bunch more data and then I'll perform some checks. I'll select everything from the customer table and then everything from its shards. So there are 3000 total rows in the customer table, which are distributed more or less evenly across the three shards. This time, if I show you the physical data, you'll see that the customer table again appears to be empty because everything's distributed across the shards. We're aware of the rows here because it's local, but the customer one and customer two shards don't appear to have any data because that data is stored on another server. Now I'm gonna run a breaking change. On the second server, I have a customer and a customer new table. I'll now drop the customer table because that's old and I'll replace it with the customer new table that we created for this sharding example. Notice that our client is no longer happy. That's because I've broken the underlying sharding for the table. I'll have to run another query against the primary to alter the customer one shard to set it back to customer because I've replaced it with customer new. And now that's happy again. Fast forward three years and now we're at the five year scale up. This is when I scale the three node UK cluster to a six node global cluster spanning the UK and the US. I'll spin up three new servers this time and wait for them to become available. These will be our US nodes. I'll enable the foreign data wrapper on all three. I'll create the customer table on all three. Note that this time I've got a region column. I'll create a customer new table on the EU nodes two and three because I already have a customer table now. I'll make the original server aware of the three new servers, US DB1, DB2, and DB3. I'll map the Postgres users from the three new nodes onto my main node. And then I'm gonna start partitioning. First, I'll create a customer partition table from the customer table with an additional region column, which I'll default to UK. I'll assume that all of my customers up to this point have been based in the UK. Obviously not a safe assumption because there would be US customers in here in the real world. And I'll partition that by the region. Next, I'll create another table called US, which will be a native partition of the customer partition table, partitioned for values in US, and then sub partitioned or nested partitioned against the ID by hash. I think at this point, it makes sense to describe what I'm actually doing here, how the hierarchy of sharding will work. So what we're effectively doing is starting with a customer table at the top level, and then list partitioning, two ways to have UK based customers and US based customers. And then within each of those list partitions, I'm creating a hash partition for zero, one and two based on the modulus 
of three. This ensures that the key space for UK-based customers is evenly distributed across the three nodes. Similarly, in the US, we have a hash partition for the ID key space for US-based users based on the 0, 1, 2 modulo remainder of three. So up here is the list partition hierarchy level, and then down here is the hash partition level, all achieved with a native partition. With this query, I'll create my first hash shard of the US data set, my second hash shard, and my third hash shard. All modulo three remainder zero, one, and two. That's the complete ID space for the US slice of the list partition. Next, I'll do the same for the UK. I'll create a native partition from customer partitioned called customer UK for values where in the customer partitioned table, I have the value UK, and then I'll create a sub hash partition on the ID. I'll create my local partition, modulo three remainder zero. I'll create my modulo three remainder one partition on the second server against its customer new table. And I'll create the third shard for EU DB3 modulo three remainder two. Now I'll insert all of the data from the customer table into the customer partitioned, all 3000 rows. Again, you'd want downtime, but I'm not gonna do that. I'll replace the customer table with the customer partition table. Notice again that there's a period of downtime that will increase with the size of the table. Then I'll insert some data into the customer table, a random ID, a random email, and a random region, either UK or US. Now I'll run some tests. Notice again that my latency has spiked. So I'm now running over 100 milliseconds per query on average. If I select everything from the customer table, I'll see what I see in the client, and that'll be 4,000 rows. If I look for everything in the UK, I'll see 3,500 rows, everything in the US, 480. That was the portion of randomly generated data from the previous query. And then my shards look as follows. 1,144 for the zeroth shard, 1,246 for the first, and 1,123 for the second, totaling our 3,513 rows. And it's the same story for the US. I'd expect to see a total of 487, which is spread across the zeroth, first, and second shards. Let's look at the table utilization again. So the only data we're aware of as being in our customer table is in the UK zeroth shard of the UK list partition. All of the other data is stored on other nodes. Now for consistency, I'll rename customer new back to customer on the other servers, which will break our client for now until I remap the foreign table back on the primary server. Now, before you think I'm gonna give this a go myself, don't do this. This isn't a working solution, and I'll demonstrate that by running a simple query. Let's start by selecting a random customer ID from the database. I've got 96A, and that's for a UK-based user. Down here, I've connected to one of my US servers, and if I do a select for that ID, I don't have it as expected, but I can insert it. So now if I do the same select, I have a value here, and if I do a select for everything in the customer table that matches this ID, I now have duplicate primary keys somehow in the customer table. This isn't an actual duplicate primary key, it's just very broken data. This isn't a solution for your sharding, so don't attempt to copy what I've done here. All of this complexity that has in some way broken me is only for one table. If I wanted to create a complete database with multiple tables, that would entail a lot more complexity. And that complexity only grows as you add tables. The more tables you add, the more intermediate partition tables you have, and it's much more complex to manage. Back in the days of running tech teams, I wouldn't have wanted all of the members in my team to have to act as DBAs or database developers. I just wanted people to act as developers, interact with the database, and not think about how they're going to shard or partition data. I think that's a concern that should be managed by the database. What happens if my user base shrinks? If my user base shrinks, I would need to repartition again. I can't simply remove nodes because then my sharding breaks. If I can't insert a row that has a modulus of zero, one, or two, my insert will fail. I need to repartition. And in order to retain any kind of integrity, all queries have to go through that one node that I created at the start, the main customer table, as we saw. If I insert data into any of the shards, data consistency, data integrity can no longer be guaranteed. This has made me appreciate why most, if not all of the cloud service provider databases use one master or primary node. It's just simpler. This model won't scale for writes. And that's why the cloud service provider databases, Aurora, RDS, GCP, Postgres, AlloyDB, and the like don't scale for 
writes as well as reads. This is a sharding of data to pin data to different locations. If my requirement was to get data to each of the customers for low latency reads from anywhere, what we would call global tables in CockroachDB, I can't do this with this setup. I would need to set up some kind of replication between the six nodes in order to achieve the same thing with Postgres. And finally, any change to the customer schema would need to be replicated manually across all of the children customer tables. This experience, and it has been an experience, has given me a much greater appreciation for what CockroachDB is doing under the covers and what it gives me in terms of simplicity for my applications. Let's see what this looks like in CockroachDB. I'll tear everything down. I'll start a three node CockroachDB setup, which is the minimum size we'd recommend for a production cluster. I'll start nodes one, two, and three, all in London. That will represent our UK market. They'll all join one another. I'll initialize the cluster and I'll connect to it. With that running, I'll create the same table that I created in the before scenario, again, without a region, because I don't know that we're going to need to expand into the US yet. And I'll generate a thousand random customers. I'll start my worker client running. Now we fast forward five years. I had a three node cluster already, so I was already sort of scaled for UK demand. Now we need to scale for US demand as well. So I'll bring up the three nodes that I'll be using for the US. There'll be nodes four, five, and six, all in US East one to represent the US. This is all running locally on my machine and they'll join the existing cluster. With those set up, I'll enable enterprise features. I'll be using the regional by row topology pattern, which requires enterprise access. So I'll enable the enterprise license. Next, I'll create a primary region, which will be the nodes in the UK, and add another region, which will represent the nodes in the US. Next, I'll add a region column so that we can differentiate between a UK-based user and a US-based user. I'm setting the UK to be the default, because up to this point, we weren't aware of any users in the US. And finally, I'll update the locality of the table to be regional by row. Notice down here that none of these operations are adding any latency to the simulated customer. And finally, I'll insert a bunch more random data, this time across the UK and the US. That was a lot easier in the cockroach example. All of the nodes can handle reads and writes, so scaling is very simple. And because all nodes are designed to handle reads and writes, the integrity of the data is safe, regardless of which node we talk to. It's true horizontal scaling. In order to partition data to the UK and the US, I simply had to alter the table with zero downtime. It was an online schema change to give it a locality of regional by row. If I wanted to make data available to all customers for low latency reads wherever they are, that would be a global table topology. I can apply global table topologies next to tables that use the regional by row table topology pattern. I don't have to use a mix of multi-level table partitioning alongside replication in order to achieve the same thing. And finally, with a setup like this, I, as a developer, have the power to create databases that scale with my application wherever my application and my users happen to be. I don't have to be a DBA or a database developer to achieve the same thing.